today I'm going to be talking about, we've got a bit of delay on the slides, um, could enhancing soil carbon, organic carbon stocks be the next wave in nature-based solutions? And I'm going to give us some um, perspectives from the UK, so some work I've been doing here and our knowledge for the UK. So in terms of what we're looking at, so there is actually a global interest in soil carbon. I think it's good that we start looking at the global side. So this is really about the idea that increasing carbon sequestration, even by a small amount across the world, can have a huge potential in helping us to mitigate climate change. And this is being picked up both in the literature, but also in, uh, in world press. And there's also this four per mil initiative that's now been signed up to over 100 countries. In the UK, we also have an interest in this, um, partly driven on by Brexit. So the UK, U, Euro, UK is now currently leaving the European Union. And this requires us to look again at our agricultural policy. And a new policy was signed into law last week on the 11th. So we're now looking at changing the way that we give subsidies to our farmers. Instead of just giving those in the past, we did them on land area. Now we're looking at a real focus on public money for public good. And that's around things like um, lots of ecosystem services, but one of those that's likely to be at the heart of that is um, soil carbon health and soil carbon stocks as an aim to mitigate climate change. We also have a huge amount of interest in the private sector and NGOs. One of the biggest of those and the leaders is probably the National Farmers Union. So the National Farmers Union has around 15,000 members in England and Wales. They have a separate um, organization in Scotland. And earlier in the year, they, uh, they launched their Achieving Net Zero for farming by 2040. So they set out how they want to make all agriculture in the UK, at least those their members are, net zero by 2040. They have multiple things they're looking at in this, including things like reducing on-farm use of fertilizers, one of, the, one of the pillars they're looking at is increasing farmland carbon storage, and they're estimating that they could get a five ton per year, so a million tons per year, of CO2 equivalent savings by increasing soil carbon stocks. So soil carbon is one of the key, key policies they're looking at. So both the government and our private sector, we also have interest from um, organisations involved in organic farming and really pushing for this soil carbon. So in the UK, where can we store all this carbon that we want to store? So the UK, we're not a very big country. Um, and the majority, we have a small amount of forestry. And the idea is we want to increase some of that. And there are policies in place for that. But actually, the majority of our land is either in grassland or arable, um, with a small amount of this actually also being grown over peatland. So it's really here where we're looking for the greatest savings. Um, and in terms of those, so in the UK, our arable and grass, and setting aside those on peatland for the moment, cover around 70% of our land area. So we have, they cover the largest area. They also have the lowest initial soil carbon stock. That means we have the greatest potential there to actually increase our soil carbon stocks because they're starting from a low level. Um, a lot of our lands are actually quite degraded from many years of being under agricultural production. So some of the things we're looking at there are things uh, being looked at across the whole world. So things like increasing plant diversity in pastures, using cover crops or companion crops in arable fields to increase the amount of cover, to not leave bare soil, and to use those crops to help increase soil carbon stocks. Reducing tillage, fertilizer use, and the intensity of our farming and also potentially switching from uh, annual crops to perennial food crops or even non-food crops and forestry. There's also some interest in amendments, so things like biochar, powder silica rock and liming that have a more direct effect on the soil carbon by directly, <clears throat> in the case of biochar and silica rock, by directly adding carbon to the soil through either weathering or biogeochemical processes. So, oh, gone the wrong way, sorry me? There we go. So in terms of whether these systems work, I've got some examples. I haven't got time to give you lots and lots of data, so I'm just going to give you a few examples. So in terms of grass and diversity, there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests increasing your pasture diversity, so increasing the number of species, and there's a, I've pulled a paper here by Yang et al, that shows that if you look at increasing from one to 16 species, you see an increase in that soil carbon stock over time. It does take time to happen, 
And it doesn't necessarily happen in all cases. So we have a project in CH called C-SLIP where we're looking at increasing diversity in grasslands. And actually even going from, uh, sorry, left to right. Um, and you can see in this case that we haven't actually found an increase in soil carbon, we're increasing diversity. Having said this, these new diverse systems haven't been in place that long. And as I said, it does take time for soil carbon to build. The other thing I mentioned earlier were cover crops. Um, so this again is a nice big meta-analysis because they're nicest to show in these slides. And this is a histogram showing the number of observations in this large meta-analysis that showed an increase in soil carbon stocks when they use cover crops to stop there being bare soil over winter. So these cover crops aren't harvested, they're grown over winter and then they're either sprayed off or they're plowed into the soil to directly add carbon. As you can see in nearly all of those cases, we see an increase in soil carbon stock, mostly quite small, but some quite large soil carbon stocks are these annual changes. The other thing we potentially look at is perennial crops. This is something I'm quite heavily involved in. We look at putting crops for energy use. So in this case, I've got miscanthus, short rotation coppice willow and short rotation forestry across the top. So these are long term crops that perennial that are grown and then harvested for use for biomass, either for energy or for building materials. And you can see in this case that anything in red is a loss um, of carbon. It, it, it's global mean potential, but it's driven by soil carbon mainly. Anything in green is a, is a gain. And in this case, the top line is comparison to arable. And we can see we get a gain in soil carbon stock. However, if we, if we replace grass and with these perennial crops, we actually get a loss. And that's another key point that these changes in soil carbon stock are quite dependent on where we put these crops. The other thing I was mentioning is our peatlands. Um, so in the UK, well, peatlands across the world have a huge potential, um, to, if they're healthy, to sequester carbon. And in the UK, we have 12% of our land area, about 3 million hectares is, is, is peatland. But ours are quite degraded, and degraded peatlands can be a very large source of carbon. So 72% of our peatlands are degraded, and it's estimated they add about 4% to our annual greenhouse gas budget, which is actually quite a considerable um, addition that we want to get on top of it. 57% um, of those are partly degraded. That's mainly our upland peatlands, um, so ones on uh, mountain sides and mountain tops. Um, they're usually degraded by overgrazing and forestry. We also have 15% of them that are under arable cropping. And this is actually accounting for more than a quarter of our emissions from peatland are these arable crops. And that's a bit more of a challenge. Um, so CH has done a lot of work on getting these numbers together for our government. So what we can do, there is a UK peatland strategy and together the governments in um, Scotland and England have contributed 24 million pounds in grants at the moment to help to tackle these degraded peatlands, mainly focus I've got to say on the upland peatlands. And what we're looking at there is tree removal and re-wetting. So basically blocking up the drains, raising the water table and returning those to much more of a bog status, which are a peatland bog, which is what they would be before. That has some economic cost to the landowners, but they tend to be slightly less than what we have under arable cropping. Our arable cropping is a bigger challenge. Um, these arable crops are some of our most productive land areas. They produce an awful lot of our um, food and high value crops. Therefore, it's quite difficult just to simply stop growing on those sites. So what CH is doing in collaboration with the Great Fen Waterworks Consortium is to look at whether or not we can look at other crops to grow on these sites that we can grow with a raised water table. So basically raising the water table and looking at pluticulture, which basically is wet agriculture. So can we grow valuable crops with a higher water table in order to protect that carbon? Because that's really what we want to do in these peatlands is restore them to a very wet system. Having said all of that, the biggest challenge I think around soil carbon and potentially across the world is actually making these changes happen. So what we want is a carbon friendly farming. And even in the UK, where we have quite a lot of government support and some funding, it's probably not enough or anywhere near enough what we need, but we do have some funding and we have the scientific evidence. That's a long way away from what we need to do, which is change our farmers behaviour. We have 219,000 farmers in the UK, which isn't a lot considering the size of the country, but to change their behaviour, we have to take into account their beliefs and cultural norms, finance, infrastructure, knowledge and skills. 
and also that wider society, what the consumers want in the media, and also all the interactions between those. And that's really where we have a lot of challenges. So really just to summarize my high speed introduction to soil carbon in the UK, we know that there is global interest, there's UK support for this and desire, both in the media and in the public government and the NGOs. We know we've got options, if we target them correctly, they can work, um, but we also know we have quite a lot of challenges to overcome. And hopefully that's me done on time. 